Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to you, f actually um, from two sides. The first side is, of course, the Friedrich, I Hayek, the Friedrich Hayek Society, which has just been mentioned by Laura. <laughs> um, it's not very humble to mention that right away, but we are one of the sponsors here, and uh, we are very proud to be one of your sponsors. I think this is a very, uh, it's, it's just a wonderful initiative that you have, European Students for Liberty as such, the Students for Liberty as such, and doing this conference here in Berlin is an honor for all young libertarians, but also for Humboldt University, and that's the second voice I want to represent here. Uh, I was happy to be able to make it possible for you to hold this conference here. Humboldt University is proud to be host of this, and I've seen some of my students in the rows. I'm very happy to have this, the two traditions uh, mesh today. So welcome to, both, uh, to all of you from both sides, from Hayek and Humboldt. Humboldt also being a classical liberal thinker, as you all know, I suppose. I'm going to talk to you about the origin and future of liberalism. That's a vast topic, a scary one, almost, one could say. Um, well, where does liberty come from? Where does liberalism come from? And where are we going? I could talk for hours on that, and that's not what you expect me to do, I suppose. But my agenda is quite long, so what am I, what am I gonna do? First of all, I'm trying to define a little bit what it is what we might perhaps be talking about <laughs> um, in order to hold the topic within bounds. Then an assessment about where it is that we actually stand when we talk about liberalism. When we talk about the origin and the future, it might be useful to talk about the present as well. Where do we stand? Then the first bit, the origins part, the origins of liberalism in terms of their stemming from somewhere in human nature, the origins of liberalism in history, if you so wish, and the origins of liberalism in theory, in the history of ideas. Then, of course, another definition is needed, the definition what it is, what we talk about when we talk about liberalism. Which liberalism are we talking about? What's the definition of that? I am sure you will be debating this over the next couple of days as well, because it's not all that simple. I will try to define a universal core of liberalism, and then I will try to assess, given that core of values of liberalism, where it is that we stand in terms of realization of the goals of liberalism. How much liberty do we have? Then asking about the future of liberalism, of course, I prefer to have an optimistic point of view, and therefore I will tell you why I think that liberalism will survive, of course, and actually it will grow and prosper, but it's not without risks. The future is never without risks, and I will tell you why I think that the idea of liberty and the realization of liberty could still fail if we don't watch out. And then I'll draw a conclusion telling you what I think it does mean for all of us. So, what are we talking about? First of all, um, we just have to separate different levels of the debate. We can talk about liberalism in practice in terms of liberalism as a political movement, um, a movement established in parliament. In Germany, we used to have a liberal party in parliament, but that's no longer the case. We can, of course, also talk about the liberal movement outside parliament, and that's you and other people who cherish liberal values. That's a grassroots movement. A grassroots movement means that you hope for social change, you hope for this movement to grow, and that's the more informal way to, to live liberal values. Then, secondly, we can talk about liberalism in practice as the real state of society and its institutions. I mean, how much freedom do we have in the institutions in our country? How satisfied can we be with the framework in which we live and in which we evolve? Um, how has this evolved over time? Is it still satisfactory? 
where are we going? For example, when you think of the European institutions, we in Germany tend to ask ourselves a lot of questions whether our institutions ultimately could be put at peril through this European um, self-generating centralization. Is that something that could endanger our liberty? Well, that's a question you might want to ask. The third level then is not practice anymore, but theory, liberalism in theory, liberalism simply as a political philosophy. Where does it come from? Where is it going? What are the new questions nowadays? Which are questions that have been more or less answered in the past? Um, so where is all this going? And then of course you will always have to bear in mind that the question about what it is that we call liberty, uh, what, what we really define for ourselves as liberty, that is something you need to bear in mind. Now where do we stand? What about liberalism? I would say that liberalism is, if we talk about the political movement, about theory, about um, the, the um, philosophy that is behind it, is something that stems from the fact that the desire for liberty seems to be universal to mankind. It's just there. You can see it everywhere, you can see it in every country, and you can see that it's never subdued. We have a history of great achievements behind us. At least in the West, things like the rule of law have been established and live well, relatively well. We have democracy in terms of political liberty that is established as well, so we are not in a situation of dire need. Um, it is true that in most countries, even in the liberal West, liberal parties perform poorly. Now why is that? Maybe it's because the great battles have been fought. Maybe it is because we have achieved so much. Maybe it is because we don't need these fights for liberty anymore. When I came into this room, I said, well, this is so GDR style. <laughs> you know, the, the wooden panels, the clock, the, the lamps, all this reminds me so much of those days. But it's only the wood panels. The rest is gone. So this has been overcome. And maybe that's the reason why the political party that is the, supposed to be the voice of liberalism isn't so popular anymore, because the need isn't there anymore. Maybe. I don't know. Um, so what do people think? When you ask people about um, their opinion concerning liberalism, liberal values, etc., et um, you will see that they show a lot of dissatisfaction with the liberal parties. So they, well, you saw that, you saw that in the elections, actually. You didn't need uh, opinion polls for that. But when you ask them, um, and that has been done, whether the elements of what we consider the core values of liberalism are still values that they cherish. You will see that something like 30% of, of these people will say, yes, we want free markets, yes, we want, well, even more people say that they're in favor of the rule of law, etc., etc. So the numbers go up. Um, so there is a difference between liberalism as a political movement and, ex and its acceptance with people and liberalism and liberty as a value that is cherished by people. People do value liberty and that will probably, I hope, never disappear. Why is that? Well, <laughs> I guess this political movement or the political philosophy behind it carries on simply because people want liberty. We like, it is true, we like to be looked after. I think that's something that simply comes from the fact that we all were small at some time and we were used to having people taking us by the hand and leading us to where we needed to go. But um, we grow up and even if we like people to look after us, we never like being told what to do. Even children don't like that. So um, we like to realize our dreams. We have dreams, we want to achieve them, and we don't like to have other people decide for ourselves. 
typically. I think that is a universal rule. Now you can say to me, well, some people uh, do explicitly ask for others to decide for them. That may be the case sometimes, but generally, as a rule, it will be hard to find evidence for that. People want to determine their own lives. Um, that's what I call empirical evidence, <laughs> and it has to do with uh, what people like, uh, it begins with Karl Menger, but on to Jim Buchanan and others have called ontological individualism, basically saying that in our being, we are individuals. And of course, we communicate with others, and of course, we rely on others, and we need others, but we have to decide for ourselves. And the feelings of success and satisfaction, or the contrary, is these feelings are always individual feelings. We are, by our being, individuals, and therefore we want to take responsibility for ourselves and decide where we are going. Now, the next step, uh, the origin of liberalism in history. Now, in history, you might want to ask, when was it that people first stood up and fought for liberty? It depends a little bit on how you define fighting. I would imagine that people stood up and fought for liberty early on, but the great events that we know that have been recorded in history were events where, um, well, before the Enlightenment period, it was mainly events that had to do with different forces of government fighting against each other. So it was always about crown against crown, or it was about church against crown, or church and crown against another church and crown. But these different elements were always establishing a kind of balance, and one of them always tried to voice a concern for liberty. And that's, of course, because it was popular and because people wanted to live their beliefs. And they found a home more in one or the other um, crown, in the other reign, um, that uh, accepted and supported a religion or not. When did the institutions of liberalism come into being? I'm talking about the rule of law, I'm talking about uh, political freedom and democracy. Well, we all know the events um, of French Revolution, the Glorious Revolution in England, etc. These are the events that are landmark events. Um, of course, the Enlightenment was, was crucial, so you have to remember the year of the French Revolution. Um, as we all know, the Enlightenment was something that helped people claim their freedom because they discovered the power of reason, the power of reason over the reign of the emperor, over traditions and all these things. But of course, there was a danger linked to that, and that's the danger of hubris. And again, you find two elements that, that fight each other, and that's the clue, actually. You can realize liberty as long as you hold these countervailing forces in a balance. As long as you do trust reason a little bit, but not too much. As long as reason is checked by the fact that it shouldn't be taken for granted that it is always right. This had to be discovered over time, painfully sometimes. But that's probably the great lesson of the French Revolution and after. When I'm talking about history, I'm not saying that history was detached from theory, and I'm not saying, of course, that history is in any way detached from human nature. All these three strands are intertwined and have to do with each other. They feed into each other. As ideas develop, history is impregnated by them. As history unfolds itself, new events feed into theory. So you have to read this as something like a DNA, you know? Something that is um, moving on and whirling upwards or downwards, whatever, <laughs> um, and uh, feeding into each other. The institutions that came out of this process, a process that took centuries, are these. Individual liberty, personal dignity as a core value, the safeguard of private property, I'm only referring to a thinker like John Locke, for example, in his um, 
his uh, justification of private property. Um, equality, individual equality before the law, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, active and passive political freedom. These are constituting elements of a liberal order. Now this is something I won't go through uh, in detail, but I encourage you to actually to read a book. <laughs> a book that some of you might know, a book called What is the West? You will find everything in there. <laughs> What is the West? A book by a French philosopher named Philippe Nemo. He shows where the institutions uh, relevant for liberal democracy actually took root. And he goes back all the way to ancient Greece and Rome and shows how the rule of law and democracy um, evolved over time. He explains at great length the role that the church played in this and how these values got confirmed over time. Um, let me just move on a little bit further. Whoops. I said earlier that we have, well, perhaps to struggle a little bit with the notion of liberalism that we employ when we talk about the future, the present, or the past, the origins of liberalism. Some people claim that they are classical liberals, some other people claim that they are libertarians, then we have the neoliberals. Actually, being a neoliberal is something that is, well, if someone calls you a neoliberal, that's usually not a friendly way to address you. Um, political liberalism is sometimes distinguished from economic liberalism. Um, then there is apparently such a thing as social liberalism. Some people say that that's an oxymoron, but well. Then um, the new head of the German Liberal Party calls his line of thinking compassionate liberalism. Then we have enabling liberalism, libertarianism, of course. What else there is? You can continue the list for quite a while. Um, There are different notions of what it is that is really important when you think about liberty. I think in the classical liberal tradition, it has been agreed more or less that it is not very useful to, to distinguish between different fields to which the idea of liberty will be applied. It is much more helpful to view liberalism as a paradigm as a lens through which you view um, societal interaction. So it will have to do with social issues. It will have to concern political decisions. It will have to cover economic action. So it is not useful to just think about economic liberalism. It doesn't mean much. But well, when you talk about the market, when the market is the concern that you're tackling right now, then of course your perspective is an economic one and then you might just as well apply that name. I'm not very um, angry about people who use these terms. Libertarianism, is it more or is it less than classical liberalism? What are the differences? Lots of papers have been written about that and I think the discussion will be going on for quite a while um, here also. The The essential part thing, I think, is that whether we agree on individual points, whether we agree on, well, policy questions such as do we need a framework set by the state and controlled by the state? Do we tend to be order liberals who think that, well, this framework is needed in order to generate a good um, coordination within the rules? Or are we somewhat more funky and crazy and believe that the rules themselves do evolve and we shouldn't tamper with them? Well, whatever our point of view is on these individual questions, talking about money, talking about justice, all these things, we do all share a set of universal values. These values have to do, first of all, with our approach, and that's an integrated approach. Liberals tend to sort of intellectually combine philosophy, economics, politics, all these sciences come together and are not only focused on one, uh, on one discipline. It's an encompassing approach. 
It is not morally blind, rather to the contrary, the morality of liberalism is something that you find when you talk about capitalism, when you find about the political regime, whatever, these things go together. So this is an all-encompassing approach. We look at rights rather than entitlements. We tend to acknowledge the fact that when people interact, they tend to have different interests, and people who have different interests will see them collide. Goods are scarce. These elements just have to do with the human condition, and therefore we have to bear them in mind instead of dreaming of a better world. So this is a fact that needs to be taken for granted, and we have to work with that. It leads us to insisting on private property, on subsidiarity and responsibility, and we tend to remain aware of the fact that, well, politics and government action may be needed, but it can never be perfect. There are many, many pitfalls. We try to analyze where that comes from, what the, the, the regularities are, but we don't trust government as such. I'm saying that here at the Humboldt University, where Humboldt, well, applied his ideas about good education, which was a little bit a turnaround from his uh, earlier work, which uh, was very critical of any kind of state intervention, but I still want to remind you of, of Humboldt's work on the limits of government action. So that's something that binds us and that unites us. How much liberty do we have today? Well, we have a lot of government intervention. We have a lot of government spending in the first place, of government economic action. We have government regulation that follows us almost everywhere. And that distorts economic competition. So, well, first of all, our liberty in the field of economic action is fairly, well, imperfect, let's say. What about the rest? Well, you might have noticed that the liberal debate in, in the media and elsewhere is now turning around questions like, well, let's say that government action is needed, government is doing the right thing, which I don't necessarily agree with, but let's just put that aside and let's think that that's the case. If we are fine with everything government is doing, are we then free? Or could threats to liberty also come from something else? And what could that be? Thinkers like John Stuart Mill have been thinking about the effects of society, about how oppressive society can be. Is that really a threat to liberty or is that a threat to something else, to happiness? Is that a natural effect of the fact that we have to, co to have our interests, our colliding interests somehow coordinated? What is that? Is that a problem of liberty or is it something else? And also, what about people who simply don't have enough money or not enough power to do something sensible with their lives? If they are legally free, if the state doesn't interfere with them in any way that should bother us, and they still can't live their lives up to their dreams, what are they? Are they free or are they not free? That's where the discussion is going now, and we need to have answers to that. Even if we think that the main threat and perhaps the only relevant threat to individual liberty is government action. Don't forget that most other people are looking at these societal uh, questions to these um, questions of factual power, of factual um, empowerment of the individuals, and we need to find our answers to that. Just saying that it's not relevant will not do, that will not be enough. The future of liberalism, well, in theory, I've talked about this. Um, concerning the theory of liberalism, I think we have to face the challenge that is posed to us now. Um, the core values of liberalism are accepted even by people who we would not necessarily consider um, our friends. But they will say that they share our values. 
And going on from that basis, they say that we are actually uh, betraying our values be because we don't look at these other things. We do not look at the question of power. We do not look at the question of material uh, preconditions. We have to get engaged in that discussion and we have to find a language to talk to these other people. I think this is where we have to look and this is where we have to answer questions. Questions of intolerance, injustice, paternalism, all of these are pitfalls that we have to warn against. The future of liberalism in practice, well, I told you I was going to tell you why I think that liberalism will survive. Of course it will survive because people want it. People want to live freely and therefore they will endorse this philosophy, they will develop the philosophy and they will fight for us. And we see it everywhere. We see it from Ukraine to Turkey. We did see it in the Arab countries. People do want to live freely and they risk their lives for it. Liberty is considered important by a vast majority of people. But it isn't achieved once and for all. You can see everywhere how easily it gets distorted. We have to watch out. But once it is achieved a little bit, even if imperfectly, you can see that it makes countries more successful and it makes people's lives better. So it's really worthwhile fighting for. And why do I believe that it will survive even when the political established parties are performing so poorly, well, because you are there, <laughs> because there's this grassroots movement underway, because young people feel that this is something worthwhile fighting for, and therefore I'm absolutely optimistic. Why could it fail? Well, we did get under a lot of criticism because we didn't explain the causes of the financial crisis very well. We were kind of, well, surprised by what happened and the economists especially didn't find very good reasons. They dropped silent. Well, that has changed in the meantime, but that was bad and we didn't, we, we lost the, the um, how do you say that? We, we didn't, we, we weren't in the leading role in explaining what had happened. Um, it could also fail because people are disappointed by the political performance. Um, because there is no real liber liberal or libertarian politician around, at least not in this country. Um, liberalism seems obsolete in the sense that everything has been ach um, achieved already. It is not so easy to explain liberalism's virtues, given that many of them have been realized. And then, because people hate us. As I said earlier, when people call you a neoliberal, well, that's usually not a pleasant thing <laughs> to say. That's not what they mean. So there is a lot of prejudice and we, 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 we need to do something to overcome that. How do we do that? How can we do that? What's the lesson we can draw from that? Well, when you defend your arguments, do really defend them. Do not just postulate them. Defend them. Explain them. Give reasons. Give causes. Build your argument stepwise. Use logic. Don't just say, I want this, you know? Do not argue in an, in an axiomatic manner. Explain to people and try to find where it is that they stand. Join them there and go the way with them. Explain, explain, explain. Do what you can. Don't expect that you can do everything. <laughs> Focus on the issues that, they're, that you're really good at and leave the rest to others. When you talk to people who don't agree, well, explain your own, own point of view and explain it well, but also show where they are being inconsistent because most of the time they tend to be. If you criticize others, you know that criticizing is easy. It's always easy to find a flaw in somebody else's argument. But be constructive. Offer your own positive view. Say that, well, this is a good idea, but actually one could even improve on it. And then you offer your own advice. And again, explain. Don't fight for something that is a total utopia. People will just think that you are being nuts. Fight for something that it is worth fighting for. Remain realistic. 
Don't think that the small incremental improvements aren't worthwhile. The small improvements are what will make the world advance. If you only think about, I don't know, abolishing the Fed and creating a new country in the ocean, that's fun. That's a nice thought experiment, but that's not going to help the world. Try and get involved in the political process at the core and do fight about, I don't know, building projects in Berlin or elsewhere. That's where the music plays and that's where incrementally you will make things change. Don't feel too snobbish to do that. Remember the limits of utopias and don't spend your time proving to the world where you differ from your own friends. That's something that I've observed over the past, I don't know, years. People within the liberal movement spend a lot of time saying, well, you are a friend of mine, but not you. You are a libertarian, but you're really the lunatic fringe. You are a classical liberal, but those are actually statists. I don't like them, <laughs> etc. Don't spend your time doing that. That's utterly non-interesting. Try to find what it is that unites you, build on that, and try to find good arguments as you go ahead addressing other people really different people. I think that's something that will help us spread the news and fight for liberal values. Don't censure others who don't exactly follow you, your line. Um, we are talking here in a university. In a university, you usually talk about science. I would l just like to encourage you to, to remain scientifically reliable in what you publish in, in the ideas that you put out into the world, remain serious, um, don't have recourse to non-reliable studies and backgrounds and, and stuff, always try to be sober and reliable, that's the best you can do, and watch your language. Um, it's just an advice I would like to give you in order to promote liberalism, Avoid black and white speech, avoid cynicism. All these things will help to glue together your small group, but it won't make you win the hearts of the larger group of people whom you need. So try and remain likable. You are. That's it for the moment. <laughs> I would like to engage in a little bit of a discussion with you after having provided all these <laughs> admonitions and encouragements. Um, maybe you don't agree with me. Maybe you see the future of liberalism in much darker colors than I do. Um, I hope you don't, and I suppose that you wouldn't be here if you did. <laughs> but uh, please, I don't know how this works. Do you have a microphone that can walk around and make people get engaged? Can I just give you my mic? Yeah, hi. Um, I was speaking with a student who came from Japan the other day um, before the conference, and uh, we were talking a little bit about the barriers to communicating these ideas uh, in Japan and in, in Asia generally. And um, we were talking about some of the cultural barriers, and uh, especially in Japan, how there's this uh, uh, the value the value of like deference to authority, status, um, and just uh, a more kind of collectivistic or, or uh, uh, where social solidarity is emphasized more, uh, more so than in the West. And liberalism seems to be more of a, a Western kind of tradition. How do you see communicating those ideas to um, a culture so seemingly different? I'm trying this. Oh, it works. <laughs> Good. Um, actually, I, I really do believe, but it's a matter of belief, of course, but I do believe that um, the value of liberty and liberalism as a political philosophy does have a universal uh, character to it. Now, the fact that some societies have a more collectivist culture, tradition, that they have been practicing for centuries, that is of course true, we, we, we all know it. Um, still, I do believe that this ontological 
individualism is a fact. We are individual beings that then assemble in smaller or bigger groups, and we still want to be free to do that. You know, so I don't think there is really a contradiction. Um, these in these countries, people usually tend to react very well. Uh, unpleasantly when you try to take that possibility away from them. So that's part of liberalism as well. Um, I'm not familiar so much with the Japanese tradition, but um, I, I've talked to some Chinese philosophers and I think that what they are doing is actually turning the idea of liberalism at absurdum. They are really turning it around and I'm not sure it really corresponds to what Chinese individuals would want. But individualism as a core element of liberalism does not mean that we are living as atoms in, a, in an anonymous society. It doesn't mean it for us. And why should it be a problem then to, be, to, to, to apply this to, to China or Asian um, more collectivist uh, countries? I, I don't think it is a, an incompat incompatibility there. <laughs> the universal definition of liberalism, it could be set as a constitutional process of uh, emancipation. Emancipation from the power of the state, emancipation from the limits that the uh, uh, society to the state uh, gets on you. Uh, but I have uh, one question, uh, because when we define liberalism as emancipation, uh, as a right for a man to follow his own path, uh, we put him out of the, out of the uh, society body, of the, of the society as general. We, uh, we make the society loose, we make the society uh, atomistic, and some of them as everybody follows his own path. And we destroy uh, the, uh, certain, uh, uh, certain uh, ecological system of a man. Because we, destro uh, we destroy through the emancipation, the traditions, uh, the uh, uh, moral values are not common, uh, they are not defined uh, in terms of rationalism, because they are defined in the term of tradition. And we destroy uh, through this um, uh, the sense of secure security for a man. And uh, this is uh, this uh, I would like to ask you: uh, Where are the borders for for the em liberal emancipation and uh, uh, traditional values of traditional cultures, religions, uh, moral values, uh, etc.? Thank you. Um, I think I know what you're aiming at. Um, I simply can't follow you in your analysis and, and your statement that by insisting on individual liberty, we're destroying society and the individual actually needs society. Society is something that emerges, that comes into being through the individuals. Indi individuals constitute society. Co society is sort of the, the side product of people interacting, individuals interacting. And as individuals interact, they, 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 um, you, you have conventions, you have norms, you have rules of conduct that come into being, and they will constitute the soft body of your society. But in order to even think that, in order to think society and culture, you have to begin thinking from the individuals that make that come into existence. So when you insist on having the individual free, free to interact with others, you enable the spontaneous evolution of society and the norms and the culture that the individual needs instead of destroying it. It's just the reverse of what you're saying. Liberty is a constituent of culture and tradition. So one last question. Here's one in the front. Yeah. Okay. Here. Uh, Hi. Ah. <laughs> but 
But then I take two because I've already said yes to this young man. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, no, yeah, nowadays we express much on the internet and we got technologies like Bitcoin uh, to challenge the financial market. And I think it's a new form of libertarianism. So uh, the pirate party, is that also, isn't that a liberal party at this moment because they are protecting the yeah, internet and they are fighting for a free internet? And it's a new kind of form of liberalism? You mean the internet and everything that is taking place online? or Exactly. Okay. Um, well, it's a, it's a chance, it's a possibility. The internet has made interaction much easier. But we all know that, well, the internet also enables control and enables um, interference with each other's lives, and that question is not yet solved. It is full of promises, and I'm not sure that uh, the point of view that some, some young people are taking nowadays who say that, well, the age of privacy is over. Face it, we have to live in a world where everything is free, and where everything is available, and everything is public. So we have to adapt our mode of living to that. I, I don't find that entirely convincing, but maybe because I'm not that young. Um, anyway, I think that's a question with which we will have to grapple for quite a while. We will have to debate it for quite a while, and we will have to find solutions. So to have promises means out there, th thanks to the internet, is a wonderful thing, but we should not relax too much. We should, I think, try and find institutions that safeguard our liberty so that we can fully benefit from this technological improvement, which it is. So then that could be something that promotes liberty enormously. And when you talk about currencies such as Bitcoin, well, Bitcoin is a bad example these days, but let's talk about other forms of free currencies. Actually, that's wonderful because it's a very clever way of introducing currency competition without abolishing the Fed. You know, you, you just open a new line, a technological innovation that will stir things up. That's terrific. That's just very good. And you had a question, and you'll have the penultimate word. <laughs> um, you mentioned the word uh, hate when referring to some uh, people with different positions when they were arguing with a, uh, a classical liberal, for example, or a libertarian. I don't think the word hate is an exaggeration, but uh, what I'd like to ask you is uh, um, where do you think this uh, certain resentment for uh, uh, libertarian ideas comes from? Because uh, from my understanding of history, in uh, the, the early 20th century and the, the late 19th century, there, were, there was a very favorable intellectual atmosphere uh, for uh, liberal ideas. Also, my, uh, in my personal experience, what I've noticed is that being against certain government programs is almost associated with being a bad person. And the reverse is true as well. Uh, you have to support this. And if you don't support a certain government program, you're a bad person. The minimum wage, you hate the poor if you, support, if you don't support the minimum wage. So uh, my question would be, could you talk a bit about uh, where does the hatred come from? But that's enough for a whole lecture. <laughs> <laughs> well, my gut feeling is that it has to do with a culture of the welfare state that has established itself in many countries of the West where this is just generally accepted as something good. And of course, the liberal movement, even in history, was always associated a little bit with that, so it's hard to disentangle. Um, well, things like the minimum wage appeal to the good in people because we want the others to live better. I mean, it, it appeals to a good sentiment in, in people, and that's what makes it so popular. And we, as liberals or libertarians, we have to explain the economic mechanics of the matter, explain why it probably won't even achieve its own goals, and why we think it's too much interference, etc. And that's complicated. Their messages are more easy to pass along. Ours tend to be complicated. That's why I said, explain, explain, explain. If you just throw out one sentence, a combative sentence, you will never convince the other because their, their point of view will be one that warms the heart and yours won't. <laughs> so you have to take the pains and, and explain. It also has to do with all the, well, 
feelings that go along with that, with greed and all, all that kind of stuff, which are human failures, and we have to count on them. They, they are simply out there. Um, it may also have to do with the fact, as I said earlier, that liberalism has already achieved quite a lot, and, and people are so settled in their daily lives that are relatively free that they think, well, this is not the issue anymore, you know? What are these people fighting for? <laughs> they think it's just not important, it's not relevant. We have to explain to them that yes, it is relevant and that our freedom tends to be curtailed from all sides if we don't watch out. Um, I think there are many reasons for that. Um, I do also find it odd because freedom and liberty are two notions that every political party uses. They all claim that they are liberals, even the Greens. <laughs> they all claim that they are liberals. So it's a value-loaded word. People tend to think that that's a good thing. But when it comes to implementing it, when it comes to really uh, producing a political approach that respects these uh, values, it's, it becomes, life becomes much harder. Um, but as I said, this is a, a vast topic and um, the reasons are manifold and we have to be patient and address. And I think that when, when people show us that they think we're crazy and we are just not living in the real world. We should just remain patient and not get angry. That's really my main message for today. So I think we have to switch. So somebody else is coming. Yes. So let me thank you for your patience and for listening to me. And I wish you a wonderful conference, good conversations, lots of inspiration. And I hope the weather will be as friendly to you as it has been so far. Thank you.